Recording in progress. Good, mo good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the first day of the Blockchain Community Days. We hope you have been enjoying the program so far. Few rules of housekeeping before we start. Please note this session is being recorded. The talk will be about 45 minutes with some time for questions at the end. You're more than welcome to share us your questions during the session. Though. Welcome use your to name the EPAM Blockchain or... Conference. Welcome. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> Will I continue? Yeah, sorry. Carry on, Thomas. I, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, please I'm note uh, this session there. is being re recorded. No, no problem, no problem. The talk will be about 45 minutes with some time for questions at the end. You're more than welcome to share us your questions during the session. Please make sure uh, you specify your name or avatar for easy identification of the question, and we will follow up on any unanswered questions uh, after the session. Then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you the topic for the next hour which has all to do with that seemingly ungoverned and unlawful virtual space that attracts a growing number of individuals and businesses. Let's switch to Michael Nichols, Principal in Financial Services Consulting at EPAM with some travel companions live from the metaverse. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome. Just put in the chat, have you visited the metaverse before? No responses. Is there anybody there? Not once for yes, twice for no. Let's go to the metaverse anyway. In conference. Welcome to the metaverse. The metaverse is not a new concept, it is still evolving. Discussing it today is a bit like discussing the internet in the 1960s. We can only imagine what the future might hold. Many people consider the metaverse as the natural evolution from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. The fully immersive metaverse is being built on a foundation of Web 3.0 technologies, including the blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and non-fungible tokens, NFTs. This will have all sorts of impacts on many facets of life for EPAM and for our clients. In commerce, training, marketing, advertising, entertainment, and much more. Many of our existing laws can be applied, and there is potential for new laws and regulations. Intellectual property disputes are one of the first areas to have troubled the courts with regard to the metaverse. Let's have a look at how things are evolving. We can only have a brief initial look. If you want further information, then please contact my good friend Mike Nichols. What is an NFT? It is a non-fungible, by which we mean unique, token, which is recorded on the blockchain with a unique digital identifier. That seems straightforward, doesn't it? Yes, but is it a security or a commodity? The first case to hit the US courts regarding NFTs was filed in May 2021. Dapper Labs operated an application called NBA Top Shot that promoted, offered, and sold NFTs known as NBA Top Shot Moments. 
This was an alleged violation of federal securities laws. The NFTs depict video clips of highlights from NBA basketball games. Dapper Labs had not filed documents with the SEC, which is a mandatory requirement for security. By selling these, allegedly, unregistered securities to investors, the defendants earned hundreds of millions of dollars in profits. The defendants, allegedly, used their control over NBA Top Shot to prevent investors from withdrawing their funds for months on end. By preventing investors from cashing out the defendants would, allegedly, ensure that money stayed on the platform, propping up the market for moments as well as the overall valuation of NBA Top Shot. What are the differences between securities and commodities? Does it actually matter? Bitcoin is not a security. It is classified as a commodity and not a security because 1. It can serve as a long-term store of value. 2. It allows for fast and secure transactions. And 3. It is decentralized. Critically, Bitcoin is free from any government or private control. There is no entity behind Bitcoin that can cause the price of a Bitcoin to increase through prudent management or decrease through mismanagement. The cost of Bitcoin is determined solely by market forces, and someone buying Bitcoin is not investing in a common enterprise. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, and a number of courts have now recognized Bitcoin as a commodity. Similarly, the chair of the SEC has acknowledged that Bitcoin is not a security. Like Bitcoin, Ethereum is a commodity rather than a security. Unlike Bitcoin, however, Ethereum was designed to enable smart contract functionality. A smart contract is code that verifies and enforces the negotiation or performance of a contract. Smart contracts can be self-executing and self-enforcing, potentially lowering the transaction costs associated with traditional contracting. Ethereum recently completed the merge, an upgrade which reduces the amount of computational processing, better for the environment and better for your pocket. Can I just tell a short story about Dapper Labs? Smart contracts can also be used to breed and collect digital cats called CryptoKitties. Dapper Labs released its first product in November 2017, called CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties use the smart contract functionality of the Ethereum blockchain to allow users to breed and collect digital cats with a variety of characteristics. CryptoKitties very quickly caught on. In fact, CryptoKitties was so popular that it resulted in a highly publicized slowdown of the entire Ethereum blockchain. Bloomberg reported on the 4th of December 2017 that CryptoKitties mania overwhelms Ethereum network's processing. BBC News reported the following day that CryptoKitties craze slows down transactions on Ethereum. Very interesting, but does it have anything to do with the current Dapper Labs dispute? Well, to make its new blockchain function, Dapper Labs needed to create and distribute a token. So, Dapper Labs created the Flow token as a native currency for their Flow blockchain. Dapper Labs distribution of Flow tokens qualifies as a securities offering under the securities laws. Dapper Labs appears to understand this. On their website, discussing token distribution, they claim to be committed to compliance with securities laws. In addition, because Dapper Labs has not registered the Flow token as a security under the Securities Act, it has restricted the public sales and auctions of Flow tokens to non-United States persons. This is because selling the token to United States investors would constitute an unregistered securities offering. How all of this will play out in court still remains to be seen. An NFT is an NFT. But, it could be a security or a commodity. Let's start with some audience participation, all you EPAM people out there.
What connects Jane Birkin, Hermes of the Fashion House, Mason Rothschild, and Ginger Rogers? The answer is the Hermes Birkin handbag. The Baby Birkin NFT. And Judge Jed Rakoff in New York. The Baby Birkin NFT was an animation of a fetus developing inside a Hermes Birkin handbag. It sold at auction for $23,500. Hermes fashion items are expensive. One sold for over £162,000 in London. Hermes did not intervene when Rothschild sold the Baby Birkin NFT. However, they sat up and took notice when he launched his Meta Birkin range. Hermes initiated legal proceedings in New York. First, they sent a cease and desist letter to Mason Rothschild. Rothschild did not cease. He did not desist. He responded publicly. He said that it was his First Amendment right to free speech to create works of art that commented on matters. He also said that it was a comment on the fur trade, and invited Hermes to work with him. OpenSea removed the Meta Birkins from being sold on their platform. Mason Rothschild responded. Rothschild appears to have received a lot of support. His next move was to attempt to have the claim from Hermes struck out by the court. He also took his case to the media seen here on Yahoo Finance Live. commodity that everybody loves bringing it to the digital world with this introduction of the metaverse and seeing how it it works out and how it plays in the hands of like the community selling it at that keeping that scarcity of 100 bags total and seeing what the community does with it because i feel like there's nothing stronger in this nft space than community and being able to garner the attention of people and build that relationship with the consumer and being able to bring it forward and keep pushing and and, and the support has been crazy Rothschild's next step was to try and have the case dismissed. He argued that he was exercising his First Amendment right to free speech with his art. Although the court found for Rothschild with respect to his free speech argument, they were not so persuaded by his other arguments about securities versus commodities. His attempt to have the motion dismissed ultimately failed. This means we have to wait for the actual court hearing on the substantive matter for a decision. In a slight twist at the end of the Yahoo Finance live interview with Rothschild, it appears that he himself has now been subject to counterfeiting. But do you have to look out for counterfeiting, uh, you know, in the NFT space? 100%. Actually, like before my collection dropped, there was a bunch of like counterfeit NFTs that weren't from my collection. We're in the process of like verifying mine in open, on OpenSea. Um, but we had like $35,000, $40,000 in volume of people buying fake versions of my Meta Birkin. So yeah, like counterfeits are definitely there. Um, I'm hoping that these platforms have more of a connection with the artists moving forward. So, you know, they don't lose out on that kind of hype and people don't get scammed and end up spending, you know, $40,000 on a fake. One final word. If you have questions about whether your specific NFT is a security or a commodity, then make sure you get legal advice applicable to the jurisdiction in which you plan to sell your NFT. The courts have not yet made final decisions, although in some places like the UK, there is a task force which has written very detailed opinions. The UK task force was led by Sir Geoffrey Voss, a very senior judge in the UK. For the avoidance of doubt, EPAM do not provide legal advice. All EPAM clients are strongly advised to consult their own lawyers for legal advice. The information in this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute any recommendations or specific legal advice.
There are many other NFT related cases going on in the US and other parts of the world. Until such time as we get final court decisions, which are not being appealed, we will not know for sure what the legal position is with NFTs. Here is a quick summary of some of the other NFT cases currently under consideration by the courts. The company behind the popular collections of Board Ape Yacht Club tokens is suing a group of defendants, including writer rips in a headline-making trademark case. They accuse the artist and other defendants of trolling Yuga Labs and scamming consumers into purchasing Board Ape Club NFTs by misusing Yuga Labs trademarks. In the complaint, filed in a California federal court on June 24th, Yuga Labs claims that Rips, Jeremy Cahan, and a number of other affiliated defendants are on the hook for trademark infringement, false designation of origin, cyber squatting, and the tort of conversion for creating and selling NFTs that bear the very same trademarks that Yuga Labs uses to promote and sell authentic BAYC NFTs. Furthermore, it is argued that this was an attempt to devalue the Bored Ape NFTs by flooding the NFT market with his own copycat NFT collection using the original Bored Ape Yacht Club images and calling his NFTs RBAYC NFTs. Yuga Labs alleges that Rips has reaped an estimated $5 million of ill-gotten profits from these sales while simultaneously using its trademarks to promote the imminent launch of an entire NFT marketplace called Ape Market solely to sell the RBAYC NFTs alongside authentic Yuga Labs NFTs. Yuga sets out claims of common law trademark infringement, as its long list of BAYC centric trademark applications are still pending before the US Patent and Trademark Office and have not yet been granted false designation of origin and false advertising, cyber squatting, tort of conversion unjust enrichment, violations of California Business and Professions Code, intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, and negligent interference with prospective economic advantage. That will be a lot of court time to argue all those claims. Interestingly, Yuga does not appear to have any copyright registrations for its ape images, and does not claim copyright infringement in its complaint, only trademark infringement. Counsel for Ryder Rips has now responded to the lawsuit waged against him and his business partner Jeremy Cahan by Yuga Labs, arguing in an anti-slap motion that Yuga is looking to silence him for calling out the allegedly racist and neo-Nazi nature of the popular and expensive collection of NFTs. A slap motion is a strategic lawsuit against public participation, which may prevent the exercise of constitutional freedoms. Nike filed a suit against StockX early this year. They allege that the Detroit-based marketplace is on the hook for trademark infringement and dilution, as well as unfair competition. This is in connection with its offering up of NFTs tied to images and physical versions of Nike footwear, albeit without receiving authorization from Nike. To make matters worse, Nike claims that StockX is selling those NFTs at heavily inflated prices to unsuspecting consumers who believe, or are likely to believe, that those investable digital assets, as StockX calls them, are, in fact, authorized by Nike. Nike later amended its complaint and made to add counterfeiting and false advertising claims. StockX has since responded to Nike's complaint, denying the bulk of the claims that Nike has lodged against it and asserting that they lack merit, disregard settled doctrines of trademark law, and show a fundamental misunderstanding of the various functions NFTs can serve. At the core of StockX's defense is its claim that the NFTs at issue are little more than claim tickets or digital receipts used to track ownership of a specific physical Nike product that StockX has purportedly authenticated using its proprietary, multi-step authentication process, putting the sale of the sneakers and corresponding NFTs firmly within the realm of the first sale doctrine. Do you recognize this guy? Type the name in the chat.
Rockefeller named Damon Dash in a copyright case, one of the first copyright lawsuits involving NFTs, and a bid to stop him from auctioning off the copyright to Jay-Z's debut album Reasonable Doubt as an NFT. Yes, it is Jay-Z. In its complaint, Rockefeller, which Jay-Z founded with Damon Dash and Kareem Burke in 1995, alleged that Dash was planning to auction off the copyright rights to the famed album as an NFT despite not owning the copyright. Setting out claims of breach of fiduciary duty, conversion, replevin, and unjust enrichment, the record label argued that Dash does not own the copyright, Rockefeller does, and as a shareholder in Rockefeller, Dash is entitled to part of its profits, indirectly giving him some of the royalty income from reasonable doubt. A judge swiftly blocked the NFT sale by granting a temporary restraining order in favor of Rockefeller, and the party settled the case in June 2022, clarifying ownership in a filing with the court that RAF Incorporated owns all rights to the album Reasonable Doubt, including its copyright. No shareholder or member of RAF Incorporated holds a direct ownership interest in Reasonable Doubt, and explicitly limiting Dash's ability to sell any property interest in reasonable doubt going forward. As the case settled, we do not have a definitive view from the court. Many, in fact, most, civil disputes are settled out of court. So it will take a while before we get a final legal view. In November 2021, Miramax filed a suit against Quentin Tarantino, seeking to enjoin the Pulp Fiction director from auctioning off exclusive memorabilia associated with the film in the form of secret NFTs. In its complaint, Miramax alleges claims of copyright infringement, trademark infringement, and unfair competition. In addition to arguing that Tarantino is likely to confuse consumers about the source of the Pulp Fiction-linked NFTs, Miramax alleges that Tarantino is on the hook for breach of contract, as his narrowly drafted, reserved rights, as distinct from Miramax's broad, catch-all rights, which include all rights, now or hereafter known, in all media now or hereafter known, do not extend to his offering up of used excerpts of the screenplay as NFTs. Counsel for Tarantino pushed back, asserting, Miramax is wrong, plain and simple. Quentin Tarantino's contract is clear. He has the right to sell NFTs of his handwritten script for Pulp Fiction, and this ham-fisted attempt to prevent him from doing so will fail. On the 8th of September, a notice of settlement was filed. The parties alerted the court that they have settled this case and expect to file their dismissal papers within two weeks. Where does this leave us? There are several undecided legal cases. If you appear to be infringing a big name then you had better have good lawyers and deep pockets. Most cases are settling out of court. If you are going to be selling NFTs in the metaverse then perhaps you need a metaverse lawyer. But even metaverse law have had a dispute. Take care it is a jungle out there and those bored apes might be coming for you. Okay, so, I don't know if anyone realized, but the two people talking there don't exist. They are AI voices that I scripted for the purpose of this presentation to show what could be done and how things are going. So I hope you enjoyed that. There's a lot of other things that are happening as well that I simply didn't have time to talk about. Um, there's a case in the UK at the moment, Tulip Trading and the Swiss Verein Bitcoin Association. This is, will be of interest to all of you who are developers because in Tulip Trading, which is actually a, an entity registered in the Seychelles, that great location for lots of Bitcoin companies and traders, they brought a claim against the developers 
at the Bitcoin Association. Um, what happened was that he lost access when hackers allegedly removed the private keys that enabled him to deal with the cryptocurrency um, on their exchange. And he asked them to uh, exercise their technical skills and help him to regain control of the lost assets by writing some code that would transfer the lost at the lost assets to a new private key to which he would have access. Um, now, as it happens, Tulip Trading are based in the Seychelles and the Bitcoin Association are in Switzerland. So why, you might ask, are they bringing it in the UK? Well, indeed, that was the first argument that's been made by the defendants. They said, we're not in the UK. What, why should we hear that? Why should this matter be heard in the UK? Um, but nevertheless, it was heard in the UK, possibly because the UK have now got some guidance, as was mentioned earlier. Sir Geoffrey Boss uh, led a committee who have drafted some opinions and guidance for the English ju judiciary. And that was why TTL, the Tulip Trading Limited, wanted the case to be heard in the UK. It went to court and it was heard by a lady called Mrs. Justice Falk. And she has basically passed it to the Court of Appeal. Um, she concluded that there was an imbalance of power in the relationship. Obviously, the developers have all the knowledge and skills to uh, do some work with the keys to try and retrieve them, um, whereas TTL don't. Um, there is an issue to do with fidu fiduciary duties uh, and whether there was a duty that was owed by the developers. But of course, that then raises all sorts of issues from a legal perspective, that it was only a pure economic loss and the common law duty of care doesn't apply in those situations. He also alleged that there was a failure to act, that basically they weren't doing their job properly. Um, but the judge said, well, if that was the case, it would be owed to an unlimited class of people. You know, anyone who's lost their keys or had them stolen. Um, and, you know, I could lose my keys today, tomorrow. Until then, I wouldn't be one of those people. You could never know who all the people were. Um, the de developers were also at risk. So th the issue has been kicked up to the Court of Appeal. And it's another case which lots of people are watching carefully to see what happens. And you know, what will be the impact on the crypto world if developers are told they have to retrieve the keys? So lots happening in the metaverse in NFT, in crypto, and breaking news, the lawyers and the regulators are bringing in new regulations, published 15th of September. The people in Brussels have issued some, a new directive that will be coming in. It's a new EU Cyber Resilience Act. It will go alongside lots of other things that will impact the whole metaverse world that we work in. The Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Operational Resilience Act. There's a lot of change coming, and that also means a lot of opportunity for firms like EPAM. There will be mandatory requirements for testing. There will be a new liability regime, uh, a bit like GDPR. People are likely to have to pay up to two and a half percent of their annual turnover 
for failure. Um, and they've got to identify vulnerabilities by having independent third party testing. And they've got to actively go out and update any systems they've sold. And the laws or the, the proposed regulations give the power to have software reclaimed. So a number of objectives to it. In the interest of time, I won't go on. If anyone wants to hear more about it, then contact me. I'm available on Teams, Michael underscore Nichols at epam.com. And these regulations are going to apply to anything with a digital element, like the metaverse, like NFTs, like cryptocurrency. So, lots happening. And it also interacts with the forthcoming artificial intelligence directive. Any questions? Hi, Ma hi Mike. <clears throat> hi, Michael. I'm, I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, chat as we speak. Let me. Uh, quickly... Are they all in the metaverse? Check. Have they I guess gone? so. Or, or we we are. And or they we are. are. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, no questions so far. And uh, let me, okay, let me, let me quickly check. There appears to be some things I missed. Uh, no, no, no questions so far. Okay. Stunned silence. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm slightly over the 30 minutes I said I would take. Um, I hope it was of interest. If anyone has any specific topics they want to hear about, then please contact me direct. Otherwise, but, uh, have, enjoy having said the that, rest Michael, of the session. Yeah, 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 yeah because you, um, I have some questions, but I'm not sure if you, uh, is, is your session, is your content, is, is it done? Is it? That, that's I, I it. I, I'll answer any questions other than the lottery numbers for this evening, because I don't yeah. know them. Yeah, yeah. No, so... Um, they're in a bit of paper in your pocket. No, they're in a bit of paper in the bin you were just reaching under. Yeah, because I, 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 have, I have some, maybe some, some philosophical questions. Um, uh, because I, I, I like the narrative you, uh, you shared with us. Um, but what, what, what I currently see is that there's, there's a lot of effort put into, uh, m making sure the, the, the metaverse, what, what, whatever that is, because that, that's of course, a, a, a definition that can be kind of tuned to a specific, uh, use case, um, is, is very much made compliant with with rules we, we currently know uh, from our world outside of the metaverse. So is, is, that, is that the best thing to do? I, I guess the, the first thing is that there isn't a metaverse, there are several out there. Um, there are, as we've just seen, attempts going on to apply existing laws to the new technology, to the new world that we find ourselves in. However, as we can see with the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Operations Resilience Act, GDPR, the Artificial Intelligence Directive, the Upgraded Anti-Money Laundering Directive, technology is moving at such a pace that the law can't keep up. And the way that the regulators and the lawyers are responding is to draft new laws and regulations. And then of course, what happens is that those people who seek to benefit from finding loopholes will find the loopholes and exploit them for gain. And as we've just seen, there are some phenomenal amounts of money changing hands for NFTs, which are just pictures of something that doesn't exist. So there's a lot of money at stake 
And that means that even when the new laws are brought in, people will try and find a way around it. The other side, of course, is that that's the, the people who are principled and legal. There are, of course, well-publicized cases like the crypto queen who disappeared with a lot of crypto funds and other people who have engaged in criminal activities. So we just have to wait and see how it's going to develop. But of course, better than waiting and seeing is actually being part of it and doing something. Yeah, no, so that, that, that I agree with. Um, because the, 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 the challenge here is of course that, that uh, legislation or any, 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 any legal constraints, they are very much say bound to uh, kind of the, the traditional concept of, of borders. So if you're, a, for instance, a US citizen, uh, you have to comply with, with certain rules. You, if you are in the EU, EU, you most probably have to comply with slightly different rules. So uh, how does that work for, for the metaverse? So if the metaverse is kind of uh, an abstraction of all, all that we know as jurisdiction, so the, the, can there be yeah, ever a rule? Yeah, the, the whole jurisdictional conflict of laws, as lawyers call it, is going to be a big issue. Um, Dapper Labs, both the parties there, are actually in Canada, but they're having their case heard in New York. Tulip Labs, that I just mentioned, are based in the Seychelles, but the people they're suing are based in Switzerland, yet the court hearing is in London. So there are going to be people who are trying to take advantage of this sort of regulatory arbitrage, trying to go to a court which is likely to be most favorable to them. Most contracts, if you enter into a contract, will include something about the seat of law. It will say, this contract is governed by the laws of, and it will also have a clause that says, both parties submit themselves to the jurisdiction of the courts of the uh, England and Wales or New York or California. So you need to check the small print because as you say, it's different in different jurisdictions. And then if you start looking at cryptocurrency, you've got wide variations. You've got China who are banning cryptocurrency at this moment in time because they want to bring in their own central bank digital currency you've got the uk where as we stand today the regulator has banned binance from selling to retail customers because they say that they're not wise enough or financially astute enough to understand what's involved and then you've got other places like uh, salvador where crypto is now recognized as a legal currency so there's lots of change, lots of opportunity for regulatory arbitrage. And for you guys who are working on some of these projects with some of our clients, you probably need to make sure that someone somewhere is keeping an eye on it. I, I agree. There's actually two questions I see in the, in the chat. Um, just start with the first one. Uh, it's from uh, uh, Punjadi. Uh, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, anything specific in terms of security that we need to take into uh, in, into account in terms of uh, the, the meta metaverse uh, while, say, purchasing NFT? When you say in terms of security, it's a very wide term. You have the technical security, making sure that you are secure, that you're dealing with the people you think you are. There is also the, the issue that you need to make sure you're dealing with bona fide sellers. You know, that sometimes these are scams in themselves. From a legal perspective, when we talk about security, we talk about having something to the side that we keep in case you renege on the agreement for the exchange of the crypto or what have you. 
we, we tend to rely on the big exchanges to do that for us. And that then leads on to concerns. What if those exchanges go wrong? That's what happened in Canada with an exchange um, that the people who were operating that in a sort of semi offline manner, that the one guy who had the keys died in India, allegedly, and was cremated before, before anyone could do an autopsy to verify that it was him and what the cause of death was. So th there's a lot of challenges and strange happenings out there. Yeah, I, 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 so th th there's indeed th there's, there's security on, on different levels. It can be on the, the, the mere technical level on uh, kind of keep, keep, how to keep your keys safe. Uh, it can also be in, uh, on the more functional level on, on what, what level of security do uh, or do we or does a metaverse version uh, needs uh, basically to to be operational so th th what, what level of trust is is required in uh, bet between between uh, the, the people actually uh, say moving around there or moving around their stuff there I, exactly. I guess yeah and then there are other issues of course uh, to do with volatility you know Bitcoin is a commodity ethereum is a commodity the price the value is very volatile um, because it's open to market forces the securities which are basically under the control of someone somewhere in terms of what the performance of the firm or the project is and therefore what the potential profit and upside is is, is another aspect you know, how do you know that it will be well managed and it won't be some sort of scam that's being set up, you know, a, another North Sea bubble. I, I find it a bit ironic that tulip trading uh, are chasing Bitcoin when, of course, we all know about the tulip bubble in the Netherlands. In yeah. 1600s or whatever it was. That was a big scam, indeed. <laughs> or in hindsight, at least. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of this we're only going to work out in hindsight. Hindsight's a perfect science. They don't teach it at university, or they didn't when I was there. So we just have to make sure we're cautious and we learn as much as we can. Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a, another question from, uh, from Dima, uh, saying you talked about, uh, you, 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 you talked about different acts. Um, uh, I, th I think w w when you talked about uh, these, uh, uh, what, 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 what's the name, jurisprudence, basically yeah. all, all the all the, uh, the, the the legal effort put into cryptos and NFTs, that that is generic, right? So it's not specific to the metaverse, or not yet. It, it's it's not yet. If you go around the world, you will find, for instance, in the UK, I mentioned Sir Jeffrey Voss, off my cap. Um, in the EU, we've got the Commission coming up with proposals for the various acts I mentioned. And in the US, you've got both the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and FinCEN, who are the financial crime people, also coming up with rules. They're not regulations yet, but they're on the draftsman's table. Yeah. yeah. And they may <laughs> not be the same in every country. No, so that I, I fully, and that, that you, that's an interesting point you mentioned there, because uh, for instance, especially in the in the United States, you have you have the uh, the SEC, yeah, and you have the CFTC. Uh, that, that, that there there is a clear there there are some clear uh, say boundaries between uh, the responsibilities of these institutions, although they may not pop to mind uh, uh, auto automatically. But uh, typically, if you talk about, uh, for instance, uh, um, the uh, DLT or the, the, the metaverse, what, 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 why not basically aggregate, come up with an aggregated set and cleansed set of rules so that distinction is not there? That, that, that is my, uh, my, my, my concern. So are we, aren't we just kind of uh, exporting uh, the existing rule sets into something new? Whereas we could actually be doing better. 
and saying, okay, let's just come up with a new clean set of rules, uh, not uh, following traditional boundaries. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge though, because at the end of the day, the rules, the laws that are brought into existence in different countries get decided upon by the politicians. And the politicians have different vested interests. So for instance, if you look at the EU and the UK, the EU are very concerned that since Brexit, when the UK left the European Union, they might water down some of their regulations and the enforcement, which would make the UK a much more attractive place in which to invest, taking business away from the EU. And that's going to apply in lots of countries. We, we mentioned China, where they're looking at their own central bank digital currency. All of these countries have vested interests. I think the only way it will happen will be if there is a, like an equivalent to the offshore tax havens, if you like, whereby in some jurisdiction, they implement an amalgam of all of these rules and regulations. But the trouble is, who will be the arbiter of what those are and how they're implemented and how would they enforce them against people who may live on the other side of the world? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there, is a, there is obviously a, uh, a, a simple solution for that and, and basically stay away from these traditional rules and 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 uh, let the arbiter be uh, basically the, the 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 code or the logic implemented in in that part of of the metaverse. So uh, I have I have one I have one say final question for you at at the end because I I, I first want to go to another question from the audience. Um, what, uh, I will just read it. Uh, from the chat, what, what is your view on the value of NFTs? With physical commodities, you can just take one, pack up and move uh, whatever. With NFTs, it seems they might be a bit more tricky in the flexibility of transfer and ownership depending on the location. In terms of the metaverse, it means dealing with different meta ecosystems. So I guess the question here is, uh, this is about NFTs as uh, as uh, as an asset. How um, uh, how 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 we deal, how do we deal with them in the sense of, of of trading, and how how does the uh, I guess the, the price and risk mechanism works? Okay, if we take a real world example first of all with the diamond people in South Africa or with the oil producers, they control the flow of their products so that they maintain a high price. In the Dapper Labs case, one of the arguments made against them is that they're not allowing people to withdraw funds and that they're doing this to keep the price artificially high. Um, so that is one aspect. The other is that um, what uh, Dorsey sold his first ever, Jack Dorsey sold his first ever tweet for two and a half million dollars. It doesn't exist. It, it's just a message. Yeah. The person who bought it was obviously banking on being able to resell it for lots of money. As far as I'm aware, he didn't resell it, but when he tried to resell it, his largest offer was $64,000. He's nursing a very painful loss. Yeah. Um, my personal view, if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Yeah. If you're one of the people who's in at the start and you can create or buy and then resell at a profit, congratulations. There are going to be a lot of people currently nursing a big loss 
who have bought some of those NFT products and the market has gone against them. But then yeah. that's all about market speculation and it happens in the real world, whether you're buying an NFT or shares in EPAM. Yeah. For, for the no, I, of I, doubt, I have no inside information on the shares of EPAM <laughs> or any other firm. No, because I, 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 I guess also one of the underlying um, uh, lines of thought in this question is the fact that, say, if you have bought an NFT in uh, one uh, corner of the metaverse, let's for, for the moment say, okay, the metaverse is just one, it has many corners. Uh, can you actually sell it in the other corner of the, uh, of the metaverse? Can, uh, how interoperable is that? I think there we have some serious challenges i think because you 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 may have bought it on a very specific marketplace a lot lots of people around there a lot, lot, lot of buzz there uh the marketplace may close down you will have it in your wallet so you think it's safe i think assuming it, it will be safe will you will you ever be able to hook that wallet up to something else and to 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 to, to sell it uh to offer it in a different marketplace there, there may be uh, apart from uh uh, uh, demand, there may be no market place, no market at all. So I think that, that that's always the risk. Yeah, transferring so, between the, these, uh, not just the metaverses, but between the various blockchains is definitely problematic. If you look at the one I mentioned earlier, the Crypto Kitties, which were bought with Flow tokens and sit on the flow blockchain it, it's highly proprietary so how you move your crypto kitty if it still has any value across to another blockchain in yep. another metaverse i have no idea no nope. no i think uh I'm not sure today or uh, later on in the blockchain community days there will be also a session uh, on interoperability so if there's people interested in that uh, topic there is a uh, there's lots of work to be done there uh simon i hope that this answers your question uh let's i i didn't see any other questions let me quickly check uh my other sources of information if there's any any other questions let uh oh there there's a uh, there is some, um, yeah, there, there, there's, there's a question from uh, uh, Elisaveta asking, is it reasonable to buy uh, real estate in a, in a, in a, in a metaverse uh, instead of buying an apartment? Uh, is, 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 is that something you well, see people, people good, do? Good, so, um, yeah, good question. Um, and obviously we're not making any recommendations or giving any legal advice. Um, that way I might keep my job a bit longer. Um, when my mother was alive, God rest her soul, she used to say to me, buy land, they don't manufacture it anymore. That's not the case in the metaverse. It's very easy to create another metaverse, more land, more property. And we've already seen cases of cyber squatting, uh, instances of issues with copyright over buildings. Personally, absolutely personally, I wouldn't be queuing up to do it unless I was absolutely certain I was going to get a return. I yep. can't go and live there. I can't go and sit there. Yep. I can have a look round if I put my Oculus Rift v glasses on. But I can't live there. Yeah. Or perhaps one no, day I, I will be able to. Yeah, and I think that is actually uh, th this is actually a great question. So as an investment, uh, as as an asset, uh, typically in the investment context, I think that that can do you uh, uh, because of my, I, my, maybe my fi my final question for uh, uh, today is um, we 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 will be will we as kind of mankind uh, ever feel at home in, in the metaverse? So, uh, uh, because we are, we are very much uh, invested 
in that other part of the world. So what 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 is needed to make us feel uh, at home, or is it just uh, a playground? Wow, that that deserves not just an hour, but probably a week of philosophical discussion. All I can do is perhaps compare it to my late grandmother. She died when I was just hitting 20. When she was born, the Wright brothers hadn't flown at Kitty Hawk. By the time she died, man had landed on the moon. That is a lot of change. And we keep on saying that the pace of change is faster. So who knows what's coming next? My grandchildren are going to see a world that I probably wouldn't recognize. So maybe you will be able to live in the metaverse. Yeah, I agree. We, we will just have to go and, uh, and appreciate its, uh, its uh, evolution. Um, have EPAM opened an office in the metaverse yet? Instead of I working from home, have. can I go and work in the yeah. EPAM office in the metaverse? There, there, there is, uh, I think, uh, thoughts about that, but uh, yeah, not, no, I haven't seen the notice yet. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, especially to Thomas for facilitating this for me. No problem. And to all the people behind the scenes, uh, Alec and Ludmilla and the rest of the guys who managed to bring me to you live. And I hope you liked meeting my two friends that I created in the metaverse. Yeah, you can always bring them next time as well. Okay. Thank, thank you, Michael. So with, with, this, uh, with this, we're closing this session. Uh, I want to thank the audience for their interest and their questions. And I also want to thank you, uh, Michael, for being uh, with us and, and sharing your story. Uh, the audience, any questions or remarks uh, after the session, feel free to, uh, to key them in, in the uh, Q&A option below the event details. Uh, I will be following, following up on those questions and, uh, and, uh, and uh, keep Michael in the loop. Thank you all. Okay. And have a nice day. Thank you.